Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome at our um, industry talk, VR and the future of dance film in pandemic times. Uh, the second day of Shortwaves Festival and the first day, first of our industry panels. My name is Regina Lisowska and I'm a curator of Dances with Camera competition at Shortwaves. And um, as a host of this panel, first I would like to welcome our guests. Thank you all for being here. Um, I would like to start by briefly introducing panels to the audience. So first, let's welcome Marlene Miller, a filmmaker and dance film expert uh, from Canada, also a jury member of Dances with Camera competition. Uh, Marlene has over 30 years of experience as a film director, creative producer, film editor and mentor. Uh, her film works and exhibitions are presented all over the world. And she's a co-founder of me dance media company Movement Perpetuel, in which uh, with Philip Sporer, uh, Marlen has uh, created an acclaimed body of work over the last 20 years. Um, also, she has taught filmmaking workshops across Canada and internationally. And she's active in the filmmaking community, was on the board of directors of Main Film for 10 years, and also is a long-standing member of Documentary Organization of Canada. And our second panelist is uh, Maya Fui. Welcome. Uh, Maya is from Germany, uh, from Interactive Media Foundation, is a creative producer and director of the virtual reality installation Das Total Dance Theater, uh, in, which you can also see at Short West Festival. And she's also co founder of, of Film Arc in Berlin, the largest self organized film school in Europe, and whose learning and teaching concept she shaped during her five years as head of the directing department. And she also worked as on board of the European network of young filmmakers, uh, Nisi Massa, in which she conceived and implemented multiple international workshops. And Maya has developed many award winning cross media interactive productions over the years and um, as a creative producer at the Interactive Media Foundation. Maya is also responsible for large scale interactive projects like the Stotele Tans Theater. Um, and last but not least, let's welcome Dr. Mark Wagenbach, also from Germany, from Tans Rauschen, dance film expert, jury member for Dances with Camera competition. Mark is uh, an executive director of EKB International Research Center for Contemporary Arts. And since 2016, he's a member of Tanz Rauschen, Wuppertal, and was a director of Screen Dance Market, also at the Screen Dance Screen Festival last year. Um, he's a former assistant to Pina Bausch and development manager for the Pina Bausch Foundation. Um, he works internationally in theory and practice as a dramaturg, cultural manager and creative producer. So once again, thanks, thank you all for being here. And now please let me outline briefly the topics we are going to discuss. And as the title of this panel says, uh, VR and the future of dance films, pandemic times. Uh, to be more specific, we would like to discuss how can creators work with such technologies like VR or augmented reality? What are the biggest challenges for the filmmakers? What does it all mean for the film curators? And what is the future of dance film? And also, what impact has the global pandemic on filmmakers and dance film productions? I would also like to invite our audience to get involved um, and ask questions. You can do it by writing a comment under the stream on Facebook, our platform, and your question will be copied to Zoom. So the panelists could all uh, also see them. So I encourage you to comment to ask questions and if possible, we will try to incorporate all of them in the later part of this panel. So maybe let's get started from outlining some general perspective uh, of how VR or AR technologies contributes to the field of screen dance. How can creators work with these technologies and also what aspects or possibilities of this do you find particularly interesting relating to your own projects or experiences? Maya, would you like to start with this one? Sure, yes. Uh, hi, Regina. Hi, everybody. Mark, Malena. Um, thank you very much to for Short Films um, Short Waves Festival for having us here and also for screening Das Totale Tanztheater 360, 
Um, I really hope that some of the audience gets a chance to experience it. Um, yeah, and I mean, this was a large um, virtual reality production which we produced um, leading up to the Bauhaus Centenary celebration in 2019. So we were looking at how the ideas of the Bauhaus could be translated into the modern times, and specifically the relationship between man and machine, um, inspired by the work of Oskar Schlemmer, who was doing at the time a lot of stage experiments um, at the Bauhaus School and the, the space idea of a total, total theater, total theater um, from Walter Gropius. So these were kind of the, the inspiration ground um, which took us off on our journey. And uh, what I really loved, and I don't come from dance film, so it's going to be a very interesting panel because this um, project has been my only dance film experience. Um, but uh, what I really loved about the experience of working in virtual reality in dance is that um, it really allows for an embodied sense of place. And this is something very different to the experience that we have when we watch dance on screen and when we watch um, films on a screen, which already bring us into the moment, but actually stepping on to a virtual stage and actually stepping into this place. And we, what we built was um, a tower, which is over 400 meters high. And you step into the space and you start um, relating to a dancing machine. And together with your dancing machine, you travel up through the space over three stages, which um, form themselves out of these um, flying platforms. So it's a very visceral and um, highly physical experience as well. And I think um, this is something that um, really only virtual reality can do. Um, and uh, the other thing which is quite new, I think, for the field of dance, um, in some ways I imagine at least, is that it allows you to um, create uh, something that's hyper real or even past reality. Because how we worked, for instance, we didn't um, just record uh, linear choreography, but instead we had the dancers, and this was under the direction of Richard Seagal, um, an American choreographer based in Cologne at the moment. Um, so he had his um, dancers, and it was four of them, dance multiple, very short um, loops of movement. And these mm -hmm. loops of movement were then put together both manually in kind of the vision of choreography that he had, but also through the machine um, into in choreographic pieces. So what you actually see is not a choreography which was designed linearly, but instead was actually a choreography um, which was uh, really built together from all these multiple little pieces. And it's, it has moments when it's different for every viewer. I apologize for the sound in the background, but uh, this is sometimes home office and my partner's actually just leaving. Um, oh, don't point. worry. <laughs> <laughs> Peace. <Sorry. laughs> That's also, also COVID reality. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly. true. Here we go. There, there might be children coming in. I <laughs> apologize if that happens. Um, okay, uh, yeah, so, I mean, maybe that for now, if, um, and I can pass it on, or if you have any questions, on top of mm -hmm. what I said for now. And Marlene, would you like to share your perspective as a filmmaker and a producer and curator? I know you also work with the interactive immersive projects. Uh, yes, yes. Um, yeah, I guess uh, I'd be um, interested in talking about, uh, oh, first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's, it's a mm -hmm. delight to be here. Um, I have to say, I was physically on my way to shortwaves back in March <laughs> and I, made it, uh, I can't remember the date the festival was supposed to start, but I was in London and March 15th, I had to jump on a plane and head back to Canada and go into quarantine for two weeks. But I almost was there. Um, should it have happened, I would have been there. So I'm looking forward to, to a future occasion, perhaps next year, um, 
it would be, be lovely to be there in person. So thank you so much for including me from such a distance. Um, yeah, so I my background is, is really uh, dance filmmaking. Um, I'm a filmmaker, I was a dancer. Um, I'm always really looking at uh, the craft of filmmaking and, and how to work with dance um, in a way that's specific to the camera and for film. Um, I've also explored different things over the years. Uh, Philip Spohr and I, who have the company Mouvement Perpetuel, did um, a 3D film with Crystal Pait uh, through the National Film Board a few years back. And I've also done some work uh, with the Société des Arts Technologiques in Montreal that uh, built a 360 dome quite a number of years ago. So uh, we were one of the first projects to explore working there. Um, it was more of a research project in the end because we realized it wasn't going to sort of bring us the experience that we wanted to share with the audience uh, with, with the technology at the time. But what I really appreciated with both of those projects, um, along with another one uh, that I worked on at the University of California with um, a neuroscientist, a choreographer, and a dance practitioner, uh, we were exploring ways of engaging people, uh, trying to create a sort of empathetic, emp empathetic sense of connection with 3D projections, looking to see if just having the 3D projections and using a certain type of movement could engage a viewer to move themselves. Um, so all of these are research projects, except for the production um, with the National Film Board and Crystal Pite. But what I appreciated with each of those uh, projects was the level of research that we were able to delve into and the idea of taking the time to really explore possibilities, to do tests, to engage with people outside of the, the dance film community as well, um, and, and really having to be able to communicate what our intentions are. Because, you know, we are still a very sort of fringe group, right? It's a uh, dance film in itself is, is very niche in a way. So it's, it's, I always find it really amazing to be able to engage with people outside of our uh, community and uh, look at creating work, look at ways to create work together. And that is something that I do find is often lacking in our practice as dance filmmakers, is taking that time to really develop projects, to, to write, to research, to do tests, like very often just due to, to budgets and access to um, equipment and crews and whatnot. It's often almost a spontaneous creation process, right? Uh, not always, but um, often. So working in, you know, any form of VR, AR, uh, even looking into AI, it's, it's that uh, possibility to explore and, and research in ways that I feel we don't um, normally have the chance to in dance film. Well, thank you. And Mark, maybe you would like to add something? Yes, maybe something little to add to this. Regina, also, thank you very much. I think I'm the only one here in Poznan. So it's very nice here. You miss something, but it's nice that we can encounter and be together yeah. here. So maybe I have a third perspective on this, which is um, as a kind of uh, what, what Regina just said, to come really from, from, from dance, but also from, from dance theater and having a very strong notion of the possibilities of a three-dimensional space, but also experience a lot of VR and um, VR projects as a spectator and and um, loving this different kind of qualities of reception you you're going through as a um, when you when you experience VR but also if you experience um, theater in the traditional context maybe just to to add what Marlene was saying I think also what is a great thing to learn from what just Maya said from projects like um, from projects like um, who are developed in the VR context, um, that research is very crucial for for also developing new forms of narration and if and how these narrations are also is my point of view is in relation to the media or the the techniques we are using. So um, therefore, I'm as a practitioner also I'm also in research. I'm very interested also how we can use particular techniques also in VR or 
artificial intelligence to enhance this reflection of, of the artistic process, of the artistic research. And I think this is also maybe also a form of empowerment for, for predict, uh, practitioners and, and people who are working with it. So maybe just, just this as a glimpse to, to come maybe from another perspective to ref, uh, reflect upon this whole field. Mm -hmm. Okay, Maya would like to add something. <laughs> Yeah, um, I just wanted to, to pick up on, on what Marlene was saying about um, the research she was doing with the 3D projections on getting people to um, interact and to have more empathy. And I think interaction is one of the key points when you think about um, interactive media, no? like virtual reality, um, that you're really thinking about um, how people are going to um, relate in reality to your work because it's a different way of relating. So rather than um, choosing the, the frame and the exact way that they're going to see your work, what you're offering them in, in virtual reality at least, and um, AR is a different story again, but um, in virtual reality is that you're offering them a whole um, world that they step into and so they very much have a choice of what they're going to be looking at so mm -hmm. your um, thoughts about the narration that you're creating and the focus that you're laying needs to be really 360 so in the moment that you're um, thinking about how to choreograph and thinking about how to lay out the movements in in the space you need to think about through lightning design through um, sound design um, and through kind of the movement in front of you, how, how you want to try and guide people. And we've had this experience um, with our project, you know, that um, because people are free to move throughout a lot mm -hmm. of um, the, the experience. And um, we, we did have a point of focus that we wanted them to kind of stay on. But then you had explorers who would just go off into the space and literally look at the wall back there and kind of the details and you know <laughs> kind of like ah, well <laughs> i hope they still get the story but it's um uh, so the creating this type of work um allows us to think really um three-dimensional and think about very much this 360 incorporation of storytelling but it also asks us uh, asks of us as creators to relent control in some way, which um, is a nice exercise in itself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Uh, but also seems very challenging, right? Because it's all, all you are talking about it needs uh, such a long developmental um, research behind the project, right? Um, so what kind of uh, challenges also you you think it was for filmmakers working with with this? Um, I, I I I could uh, start on that. Um, I think the challenges and the benefits can are sometimes the, the same. Um, I'm working on a project now with um, Hanna Pagala Asefa mm -hmm. from uh, Helsinki. She has a, a XR project called Skeleton Conductor, um, and and just the amount of people we have to rely on to develop the work can be challenging. But at the same time, we're finding there are a lot of people that are interested in working with artists and um, developing projects along those lines. So we are working with uh, in, here in Montreal with Concordia University. So they have a VR lab and it's open to all the different art, artistic disciplines and you work with the students. So, you know, you're bringing in a project that allows them to gain experience, to share their uh, knowledge with us that we don't necessarily have um, and, and, and work in the lab. So there, I think are sort of new avenues that we can explore, um, new collaborations that we can look into. And some of them are in educational institutes, some of them are in industry, because um, also in, in Quebec here in Montreal, we have um, the high tech sector is, is just booming. Um, and a lot of companies have, not a lot, some companies, you have to find them, that's the thing. If you can find them, 
the, there is room to uh, collaborate. But um, they're engaging with the Montreal arts community and there's competition each year where artists, uh, visual artists, performing artists um, can pitch projects that they'd like to explore in AI, say, and then they'll match them with a company that's interested in the ideas that you're bringing forth. Mm -hmm. So to find that support that you need to move your project forward might be challenging, but it, it also can be uh, available to you mm -hmm. if, uh, with, without high costs if you can find a good partner. Mm -hmm. I'd be interested to know, yeah. Maya, how you developed your project from the ground up. Um, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it was a long um, process. I mean, there was a lot of development which happened very much in the conceptual phase at the very beginning where it was just about figuring out um, what to take of the Bauhaus universe, you know, and, and where to focus on. But once we had decided that we wanted to work with dance um, and these ideas of Oskar Schlemmer, um, then after that things started rolling what um what we did i mean we had the very kind of brainy part of the project which was really taking these ideas of oscar schlemmer um, and we took a text that he wrote in um, 1925 where he was describing almost philosophically four different types of um tanz um what tensor mention he called them so dan dancing men and they were um Oh, sorry. The kids are home safe. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Hello to the kids. Um, and they to close the door again. So I mean, um, so we had this brainy part, which was really then um, looking at these four different types of tensor mentioned from Oscar Schlemmer, and um, thinking about how to what to do with them in terms of um, the visual creation and the the translation into a modern time. And this was the work we were doing together with Artificial Rome, um, our technical partners who also did um, the development, the coding and the, the whole design of the project. And, um, and the other part was really translating that idea or those ideas into choreography. So one of the things that um, Richard Segal then did as the choreographer leading that, um, that aspect of the production, he, you know, he said, so um, the way he thought about these characters um, that Oskar Schlemmer described was by, um, uh, how do you call it, by casting. So he cast four dancers who in his eyes um, embodied, you know, technical organism, uh, embodied mm -hmm. uh, ambulant architecture. So, so this was his way of going about it. And then together with them, they were looking at um, what sort of movement would um, embody this sort of character together in conjunction then with the design. And because the design is fully virtual and it didn't exist like the designs of Oskar Schlemmer's costumes, which were super heavy and kind of bulky and actually made the dancers, um, like restricted the dancers' movements just simply through the fact that they were there. What our costumes did is they restricted the dancers' movement um, virtually. So the dancers had to, and you see this in the making of, which is also um, on, on your page, Regina, um, and people can look at, but uh, basically they were, when, when we were capturing them, they, um, they didn't have any costumes on. And so they had to, by looking at the projection of themselves in these virtual costumes, figure out what sort of movements they could do and which movements they couldn't do. Um, yeah, and I mean, there were so many aspects um, of it and um, my experience with virtual reality productions um, has been slightly opposite of what you're saying, Marlene. Um, they're very high cost productions simply because um, the time that it takes to build 3D worlds is very high. And, um, and maybe that's kind of also where you need to put the differences is it a fully built uh, 3D environment or is it something where you can work with um, real film still um, sort of this, these are things that uh, of course take the budget. 
Um, yeah, and maybe Mark, you wanted to add. Yes. yes, because this would be lovely because I think it's a fantastic project also what you just described and also like the kind of Malin, what you also meant with the kind of um, almost hubs or ways coming together or networks you can create. But actually, to be honest, I really see also in this enormous cost, Maya, you were just pointing it out a problem and also an exclu um, exclusivity in a way. I mean, um, we both or we groups come from very privileged countries, very privileged contexts. So what does it mean for the production, from for the outcome and for for the vision which the VR can offer and for um, for all the context. So I think this is, from my point of view, very important also to take in consideration and basically also maybe developing different kind of concepts for it. So really, how could we um, engage in a democratization of this or how could we make it more accessible for different people? Because also, I'm not quite sure what's your experience, Maya, but who is writing the codes? I mean, I'm... I would be um, interested who who strong is the diversity in this context and um, and really to to how we can open up this development for really a range of people and um, I know there are programs coming up and um, and therefore there will be also content related but you know who has the resources who has the knowledge how could there be a, um, a transformation to really enhance and to engage a larger group of people to be or to participate in this because I think mm -hmm. this could be then a chance to also use it in different ways because I think it's also important to ask different questions also how you deal with this um, with this with this context of being immersed or being um, in another reality what does this mean for society what does this mean for people you know if you if you if you dance on you still can or if you still can take or if you're in a three-dimensional room you still can take a stone and throw you know if you know to throw but so what is the political dimension of it mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, uh, Maya? <laughs> yeah just briefly to to answer this i think one of the first ways to maybe think about spatial storytelling in that sense which is the cheaper way is to really start um, looking into 360 production mm -hmm. so you know the 360 cameras um, they are quite cheap nowadays they exist with kind of gopro mounts and i think this is something to think about and experience meant with maybe at first um and then i mean we worked in in unity and um and i'm not a coder um but nonetheless um and okay i have editing skills but the program is fairly um at least in in some ways um you can learn some simple things with it i think without kind of the necessity of wanting to create something like das totale tanztheater which literally it took us um nearly two years of production mm -hmm. um and a lot of people working months and months through just kind of putting that thing together um there is ways of trying to to experiment in in smaller ways and i think like malena was saying then for this university context or or small studios or people students that are kind of learning this is where maybe um this this learning um, phase happens. Mm -hmm. well, uh, thanks a lot. Well, let's uh, maybe move on and also discuss a little bit uh, the impact of pandemic and the situation we have now, how, how it impacts filmmakers and also film curators. So we see many new strategies, mostly going um, content going online, but in case of VR, it seems much more complicated and to adapt in terms of presentation possibilities. What's, what are your experiences? Marlene, would you like to start on this? Um, well, uh, just bridging that idea with uh, what Mark and, and Maya were talking about, uh, there's an idea of accessibility, and this is something mm -hmm. we're looking at right now because of the pandemic, how can we access work, but also how can we access the tools that we need to experience the work? Um, and I, I was just doing a little search on online earlier because um, uh, some filmmakers I know did a very simple 360 VR project. And I remember I was in the studio and I was able to see it just wearing this little sort of cardboard headset that you can slip a phone in. So there are tools like that um, that can be easily distributed, 
purchased, you know, I think they're like 10 euro to, to buy the box and, and most people have phones these days. So if we're looking at projects like that, I think there is ways to, to access the work um, and then to, to take it to the next level to create the work like in communities, in places outside of, you know, big cities where we, where we do have access and financing potentially um, mm -hmm. and, and coders to work with. So how can we create work in a way that is, um, you know, that, that people can, I just keep going back to the word access, but uh, that also does bring me around to accessing screen-based works uh, during the pandemic. And I've been so impressed with how festivals have turned around uh, at the last moment and, and turned their festivals into virtual festivals. And um, having, having a new film, that had to be finished during the pandemic, uh, experienced that whole uh, sort of, you know, stress of not being able to be together with the team, even in post-production, to be able to go into a theater and listen to the sound together, to, to see how we're experiencing it, um, to have feedback, to rework the, the score. Uh, sound was a really big component of uh, the film that we just released. Um, so it was a big question, do we wait till this pandemic is over and we can get back in the theater and, and screen it with a live audience? Um, or do we go with an online uh, platform? Which we did, and, and I thought it was really great because who has the possibility to travel all the time to get to these, these festivals? It can be quite um, small, again, you know, within our community of screen dance. We, we don't have like thousands of people coming to screenings. It could be hundreds, it could be less than that. Um, and yet, uh, we, we launched navigation um, with, with Simon um, Files at Screen Dance Scotland. And the beauty of it was we did a live screening uh, with a discussion afterwards. And there were people like from all over the world, um, you know, at that event. So we were able to share it in a way that we wouldn't normally share it if we were in one location in one theater with the group of people that you know, again, we're privileged enough to, to be able to, to travel to that spot. Um, so it's a different experience, but I think it's it's showing us new opportunities as well and new ways of sharing, of interacting. And just within this, like I, like we're seeing who that there is a community in, in uh, dance film or screen dance. Um, I haven't been able to participate that often, but there are our regular meetings between festivals, uh, filmmakers discussing like how to move ahead, how to deal with the situation. And, you know, I find that all very uh, reassuring that we're finding ways, we're finding ways of adapting. Uh, production is complicated in its, its own way. We have done two since the pandemic has started. And, you know, we, we followed all of the guidelines. Everybody wore masks. We were distancing as much as possible had a lot of hand sanitizer on set, mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, and, and the dancers themselves, like that's a whole other situation that has to be considered, right? How do you create work when you can't be close together? So challenges everywhere, but some opportunities as well. Yeah, Mark, would you like to share your thoughts on this? Yes because I think it's great what Malin said. And I also think this discussion is interesting to see it in the context of sustainability. You know, mm -hmm. everybody's talking about sustainability in the world and we still, I mean, um, traveling is a big, big point of it. And, um, and to, to see different, um, different contexts than um, what, this can, what this can be and um, maybe to find a hybrid form um, is maybe also um, a, a way but um, I think from my, from my point of view, and you just mentioned that you created this before also, um, particular festivals creating a context around stuff. But I think it's very, from my point of view, very, very important to create this context for the perception of what you're seeing. Because I think from, from as, an, as an ordinary viewer, it's, um, it's, we know it's something different if you see, um, if you see a film in a... Um, cinema theater online and and also which kinds of to come back to this this notion of the political what does this mean also when we just in the in the politics of this frame you know we are um we have a particular way of communicate we have a particular way to talk which is actually very normative you know we all set out our phones we do this and this and i think it's just 
it's it's the other side maybe of the spectrum you just mentioned and and i think it's interesting to see also what's in this massive content which is now also online really um has his or uh, has or gets a space for it because i think there is a also particular economy and logic to this um system or to this permanent streaming and just putting content for no money online and you know and just giving delivering content so to find ways to really um, get it valued, I think that's a um, that's an important thing to do. But I think there are ways, and we can finding more ways to do it. So therefore, it's um, it's important step to go further. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And Maya, maybe you would like to share your experience. Yeah. Um, I mean. Um, so distribution of virtual reality work is quite difficult. Um, it was difficult before the pandemic. It's um, nearly impossible right now in, in these times, um, at least in terms of the larger scale interactive work. Um, not so much like we're having a chance now to, to show the 360 work with you, um, but the larger interactive pieces, they require um, a lot of handling, a lot of um, people got to travel to set it up and, and there needs to be a lot of um, uh, a, a com like accompanying work, you know, to handling, helping people. And one of the things is, of course, that uh, virtual reality glasses, they sit on your face. So in times of pandemic, um, most people don't want that. So, it, you know, we already always had um, hygiene um procedures in place but nowadays um it's it's of course more and so what we've experienced is that um we've had uh, cancellations of festivals and and places where we were we're going to show um not only the totale tanz theater but also our other virtual reality works and um and one of the other things about distribution of vr work is that it actually makes you no money um so really making a living of virtual reality productions is at this point at least in the artistic field is at this point still um not possible really um so we are lucky to have um been able to fund our projects through cultural funding um you know and and we kind of each project we scrabble um money together from different places um as everybody does to, to be able to kind of get things off the ground. Um, and we're, we're um, with each of our productions, what we're looking at is how are the markets forming and what, uh, what possibilities are there and kind of our collaborations with um, institutions and museums. You know, we look at licensing deals and things like this. So it's very much a young field, but um, one of the things that did happen in the pandemic is that you suddenly have had um, in the course of a couple of months, I think, uh, a development which would have otherwise taken five to 10 years in, in, the, um, in the world of uh, technology and how we as people use technology. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, getting back to a point that I think um, Mark was saying earlier about um, what does it do to our reality when we kind of have virtual spaces? I mean, we're living through it. We're all suddenly living in in, in a highly virtual time. And, um, and I have a sense that um, this kind of progression, you know, because what we're seeing is that the way that we're working together is changing. So we're all working with a much, many more digital tools. So we're working in Zoom and we're working with Mural to kind of brainstorm and we're working with whatever kind of Google uh, technologies they are. But what's happening more and more also is that virtual reality is being used um, for kind of co-creative spaces building. Um, and people are really more even than meeting now like this on Zoom are meeting in, in these virtual spaces. And I think, um, and I haven't looked at it because um, I don't have the dates in my head right now, but the, um, Venice Film Festival, the virtual reality um, exhibition, they are actually creating a virtual space in which you then again can see virtual pieces. Mm -hmm. So I have a sense that what we're living through right now is um, going to give virtual reality a boost. Um, 
and I do hope that it um, gives us a boost so that it actually helps artists to make a living of it and, and mm -hmm. that more funding comes out of it. Okay, thank you. I, I guess that leads us to, to the last question, that which is um, referring a bit to the future of dance film, which uh, uh, you already also mentioned in, uh, in your speech. But uh, so let's discuss this future. Is it uh, the future of dance film, or in the country, or maybe is it rather another path, and where you see the potential or challenging uh, challenges in the context of performa performative arts. I guess we can just sum up it a little bit before we open up for the audience questions. Uh, Mark, would you like to start? <laughs> yeah, maybe also to add what just Maya said, because mm -hmm. I think it's very true and also very interesting that it, there is a transgression of spaces, you know, or like a hybrid mm -hmm. context of what's the digital, what's the... You no, know, I also don't want to idealize the three-dimensional space, you know, because this is also a kind of very bizarre and romanticized concept. But and therefore, I think it's so, so, so interesting to see, especially this point, to see this transgression through different practices and then thinking about, and this is for me then, I mean, future is also for me a problematic um, term or concept, but, uh, but to see for, for each, each special um, artistic practice a specific form of narration. So to develop a um, particular narration for this quality of interaction or interactiveness, to create a particular narration for dance film and really see what can you do in this, in this genre, in this context, how can you establish really a, um, a narration which is nurtured or supported by, by movement, you know, and how this goes on and, and, and what are the, the, um, the possibilities of dance in three-dimensional space. So I think it's very interesting and to put um, um, to put to the front the, the, um, the idea of that there are different notions or different ways of perceiving and maybe and creating out of this a new hybrid form. So it's really to see the, the possibilities of it. And I think this is what I found most futuristic, you know, <laughs> most like in the sense of mm -hmm. to go on or stimulate a, um, a kind of um, or, yeah, or way how we perceive reality, which is complex. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Maya, would, would you like to add something to that? Yeah, it's a it's a big question. <laughs> the, where does the future of dance film go? Um, um, you know, I was thinking about it, and in in a way, I think it has to do with um, a couple of different aspects. On one hand, is um, who are you creating the work you're creating for? You know, like who's your audience? And um, and ultimately, because we do all want to live of the work that we do, um, we need to think about where we reach our audience. And um, it seems that at the moment you reach a lot of the people, and especially the younger generations, on their mobile phones. You know, mm -hmm. and so already this kind of gives a little bit of a hint. In, into this thinking of um, where where storytelling and where is kind of um, dance film or or film for that matter going, um, and the, the interesting possibilities that are arising within kind of the mobile phone, for instance. What's happening right now is that you can actually um, build three dimensional spaces, which are um, on an external server, but you can access them on your mobile screen. So you just access kind of a web page and then you're suddenly on your phone, you've got this three dimensional space and you can just kind of move through it and look at object. And I mean, that's kind of, you know, futuristic. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, surely we'll see uh, big brands and, and car makers kind of using it first because they have the money. But, oh, <laughs> you know, at some point artists will be, over, be able to take over that space um, and um, and in general, I think one of the things that the pandemic has um, done for me, as much as I do love um, the possibility of kind of being in these fantastical worlds, and um, I, I do love um, the, the physical space, you know, this is a very personal thing. So um, 
I think that that probably there's going to be a, a surge also in this how can we come together in in new ways in reality in reality this as as uh, maybe a little a little idea in this direction thank you and Marlene would you like to add yeah well I think uh, both Mark and Maya you've been so eloquent in, in expressing these ideas which I completely uh, agree with um, I'm not sure what I can add to that um, I think one thing about VR coming into the dance film world uh, I guess I don't see it replacing it in any way it's like another way of exploring and expressing ideas and, and telling stories um, but one thing that I, uh, I'm appreciating about it right now is the fact that it is sort of breaking down the walls of division between the, the different uh, forms of film, you know, because like, like I was saying before, like we're really in our niche in the dance film world. Sometimes we break out depending on what our films are talking about or, you know, they, they can obviously be in, in other categories as well, but we do have those categories. But I find with VR now, maybe because it's it's new and it's fresh, it's uh, it's kind of its own genre, you know? It, it can be documentary, it can be dance, it can be animation. So often when there is uh, a VR exhibition, um, there'll be dance works in it, you know? Whereas if it's a film festival, there might not be dance works unless there's a special dance film section or category in it. Uh, so. I'm I'm enjoying that that it's it just seems to be in some ways kind of shattering the the distinction between all these different forms and allowing a lot of them to to come together and I'm sure as as a curator we have a, a great center in Montreal that uh, only shows VR VR works and yeah you can see something by Laurie Anderson you can see something about the moon you could see something dance related so I think it's a beautiful way for people to be introduced. To, to dance in media. And, you know, with um, the VR, AR, as a viewer, you become a user now. So you're engaged in a different way and the potential to become a mover yourself as the user uh, is there in a way that, that you don't have, of course, when you know, you're sitting back and immersing yourself in, in, in a well-crafted film, um, you have that ability to participate in, in a way that I appreciate. And I and, uh, think there's a lot of potential for that moving forward to really engage your audience as active participants in what your story is that you're telling. So hopefully, hopefully more people. I, I, love, I love engaging in VR. I'm still, you know, not sure about creating, but uh, I'm really still interested in exploring it. Well, thanks. Thanks so much for, for sharing. And I think now that's the moment when we can open up for questions from the audience. We have already three questions from Simon Piles. Uh, so um, is there a way of involving improvisational practices in producing or does it require 100% advanced technical planning? Who would like to answer this one? <laughs> Uh, I could just uh, talk about the, our experience with uh, Hannah's uh, project, Skeleton Conductor, because it is based on improvisational movement by the user. So you have to move to make anything happen. It's, it's, it's your movement as a user that generates the soundscape and the visual landscape. Um, so, and because we're still in development with the project, I feel those improvisational practices are affecting the, the design and the coding and everything else, which does have to be technically planned, but we're kind of, by having people come in and move in the space, it is affecting how it's being planned. So I don't know if that answers the question mm -hmm. for the, from the design uh, or technical concept, but it is being designed to be an improvisational tool. Great. Maya, would you like to add something maybe? Yeah, I, um, I think it really depends on the project that you're doing um, because of course you can work um, with improvisation in terms of um, 
for instance, I mean, we were, as I was saying, we were working with, um, oh, what's it called? Uh, <laughs> motion, I want to say motion recording. The, the name has just escaped me, sorry. Um, you know, and when you, when you kind of record the motion, if you want to put it into a 3D program, you could do improvisation. You know that that wouldn't be the problem the question is what what end result do you want so i think um in in terms of wanting to stitch together um a, a choreography that um, is built out of many different pieces um hmm. let me think i mean ultimately richard um while he was kind of uh, working with the dancers he did have a number of movements that he wanted to incorporate, but actually the, and this was a big topic, the actual kind of creation of the choreography was done on the computer. And so it was there that he worked with um, the coder to put together all these different movement files. Um, and a lot of things were tried out and actually um, we we experimented and um, found a really good way of working with improvisation, which came through the machine. So through kind of the code, actually made um, the dancers move in improvised ways. Let's say. Um, mm -hmm. I, I hope this was clear. Sorry, this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thanks, Mark. Would you like to add something? No, you know, I mean, it's like interesting because it's like, oh, maybe just short. I found um, now from again from somebody experienced VR very strongly. Um, sometimes it's like, um, what is improvisation? You know, or what, where are the where are the gaps when when you are within between, or which kind of dynamic also um, um, takes its place when you receive it? You know, mm -hmm. um, so it's quite. I mean, I know it's also sometimes it's also improvisation scene also like in this ideological context of, you know, finding a space which is not determined before, you know, and getting like a new liberal or free space. So I think it's mm -hmm. more to really go into detail. It's very complex to see it in this context. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, for the next question, I would suggest maybe we will change a bit the order of moderation. So you just raise your hand and, and jump in when you want to share. Uh, um, the next question also um, concerns the accessibility of this technology, how accessible it is to disabled people. Are there examples of work that starts that start out with premise of accessibility and inclusivity? Yes, Maya. Uh, I mean, when you think about the distribution of work, um, in VR, you're thinking also because you're working um, with festivals or museums, and then the question of accessibility is always there. Um, so, you know, as it is in general, how you, how most productions still work is that you wear the glasses and you have controllers in your hand, um, and that also works in a wheelchair, then it's more an accessibility question of, um, of the space mm -hmm. itself, I would say. Mm -hmm. So maybe I will jump into this question also. There is a very um, interesting research project. It is called uh, Be Another Lab. And they created uh, the machine to be another, which uses VR uh, technology to actually switch the um, impression of, uh, of um, how you perceive your own body and you can switch it with another person. So it is kind of a installation but also it was from the beginning uh, developed uh, in with the idea to give uh, people who are disabled on different levels uh, the feeling of uh, their body the perception of their body in different ways so maybe that's answering the question um if uh, someone would like to ask <laughs> add something just just please jump in and maybe if not let's move to another uh, one also from Simon. Is the technology open and accessible to diverse communities? Who has the power in the technological space? That's a very good question, I think. Mm. Yeah, but this maybe this is also what I mentioned before. I mean, this is a question. 
it's a question of resources, it's a question who can code, and it's a question of the of the um, constellation of the people who are doing it. And I think it's very good to to look at to look at it, and and therefore to to find structures and developing structures to um, um, to go further. Mm -hmm. And to have an awareness, maybe first of all, that there is a problem, or that there is an um, exclusivity, and to really create um, a diverse um, structure. Yes, and, Maya. And on the other hand, I would say, you know, um, when you start out as a filmmaker, what you do is you get some. Back in the day, nowadays you can get a phone, but back in the day you get some little camera, whatever you can find, and you start making. And ultimately, it's a similar thing with these sort of tools, you know. Um, Unity is out there, you can license it, and I think there's even kind of student licenses. Um, there is a tons of actual material online where you can learn. Um, there's a ton of, like there's these huge library as, of assets. So, you know, it doesn't mean that like if you set up um, a working space in Unity, it kind of works like Final Cut, um, similar sort of uh, interface. And um, the only thing is that instead of working linearly, you're actually spacing, like you're, you're working in a three dimensional space. So you've got the three axes and you can play with objects in that space. And um, you don't even have to create all the objects because there are um, libraries for that, for movement and for people. And so, you know, it's, it's a question of, um, this is simply new technology. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's simply the time when, when people need to get interested in it and, and make it their own. Um, and I think, um, so of course, at the moment, there's not so many, um, it's not that affordable because it does require a lot of handwork. Um, but the more people start working in this field, you know, the, the more um, people start doing by themselves. I, think. I guess the next question from Janet Ginslow also goes with the same line of uh, accessibility of this type of technology and um, um, that, uh, uh, how accessible is this for those who cannot afford 3D VR uh, technology? Uh, but I guess already what you said already covers it a bit. And um, the next question is also from Simon. Uh, the question of with the availability of 4K on the new smartphones like iPhone Pro, along with apps like Filmic Pro, do you think filmmaking and storytelling skills will improve with advance in this technology? Hmm. It's a very specific question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you mute. Malin? Yes, I, I'm good now. Okay. Yeah. I didn't realize I was unmuted. Um, Simon, I like the, the, the key word for me in that is storytelling. And yes, it's fabulous to have all the tools, but storytelling skills are still skills that need to be um, built, right? So uh, I, I see the question there being more about how do we develop storytelling skills now that we have access to tools to easily make um, films and projects and you know beforehand talking about VR everything will becoming more accessible and more affordable um, and the idea is that you can have it eventually in your home like you have to get the the uh, apparatus to the to the user but it's something that you can uh, use without having to go to a theater or without having to go to a gallery in many cases, right? You can have the controllers, the headset, um, and a computer. I know that sounds like a lot of things, but it can be brought into to schools, can be brought into um, hospitals, it can be brought, brought into centers where people uh, have restricted movement. Um, but yeah, the storytelling thing, I still think we need to develop storytelling skills to, to match the uh, proliferation of, of fine technology that we can work with. And maybe to just add to um, develop specific storytelling skills mm -hmm. fit with, the, with the practice you're doing. And I think this is just a great challenge because we can go on the technical side very far, you know, but, um, but still <laughs> there has to be a story uh, there has to be storytelling and, um, and yeah, I see also sometimes a bit problematic. 
or problems in there how you how you um, how you tell the story in in, in um, or specifically for vr or whatever yeah mm -hmm. and i think yeah that's the that's the point no ultimately it's about um telling telling the stories for for each medium and even just in thinking about telling stories um for these small screens you know suddenly we don't have beautiful cinema screens anymore but rather kind of uh think that people are watching everything you're doing here so the way that you frame um each shot you know depending on how you want to distribute your work needs to take that into consideration also yeah. mm -hmm. wow well, thanks so much i guess uh, that brings us uh, to the end of this panel it's um well there is maybe one last thoughts you would like to share um something you would like to add uh, well, I'll, I'll just say, I think there are more questions than answers. Um, a, a lot of the points that people are raising are mm -hmm. concerns that we all have. And I think we have to keep asking those questions um, to, to, to move forward and, and to find ways to uh, bring people in and, and keep it less exclusive. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, maybe, maybe also to add quickly, I think also that I'm very interested, or I think it's also a great challenge to develop stories which are fitting to each meeting. So to really see something which is particular and, and can engage people and really has the necessity to watch or to experience. Mm -hmm. Okay, Maya, any last thoughts because before we close the meeting? Ah, um, yeah, sorry, I've got the I've got the chat open here and I do want to yeah. point one one thing Jeanette's asking one mm -hmm. one more question, which is yeah, it needs a generation of coders and developers assigned to a project to make your own and retain our rights to create materials and stories. Um, you know, I, I just want to say that um, as in film and, and dance film or any type of film. Um, it's a collaborative process and the people that you bring in on board are your creative partners. And so I think it's really important that in the moment that you step into this more technological field that you actually maintain that sort of um, understanding that actually um, the people that will write the code for you or, and do the more technological side are also creative partners. And, um, and so especially when you're um, starting out i think you know um rather than thinking about um who maintains the rights of work um, when you're starting out it's more interesting to think about actually how can we collaborate and how can the knowledge that they have maybe because they're gamers also and kind of you know a bit of nerds in a much different field how can their knowledge kind of feed into your project and then of course later um uh, when you when you come into larger budgets um, and you actually hire somebody and pay them to do the work for you, still maintain that kind of creative collaboration, look on it and see what you can learn um, together, but then you automatically keep your rights if you do um, your paperwork right. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think that covers the question. Uh, I think that was all the questions we had. So thank you once again very much uh, for contributing to this panel. Uh, thank you for being here and thank you our audience for getting involved in the conversation and for being with us. Um, I also invite all, all of you for the, our uh, next panels. Uh, please check our industry program. And um, thank you, goodbye. <laughs> Thank you, so much. Thank you so much, Regina. Cheers. Everybody. Ciao, ciao. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>